Ocean currents define the habitats of marine animals, the courses of ships, and the paths of icebergs. One of the most famous is the Gulf Stream, a warm current flowing northward and then eastward off the North American coast. Sea captains sailing westward set courses north of the eastward flowing Gulf Stream, while hopefully staying south of the dreaded icebergs each spring. Far to the south in the tropical Caribbean, the equatorial sun warms the ocean surface and supports life in shallow coral reefs. In this tropical marine food chain, phytoplankton convert solar energy and carbon dioxide into organic matter to feed a hungry ocean. Swimming animals nourished by the phytoplankton then contribute to the stirring of the ocean, bringing cold, deep ocean water toward the surface. This cold water replaces the warm water flowing northward in the Gulf Stream. This warm water eventually contributes to the melting of icebergs far to the north off the Newfoundland coast. Many marine animals, including whales, ride along the Gulf Stream as it moves northward near the coast of the Carolinas and then out into the open Atlantic. As early as the 1700s, whaling captains knew about the Gulf Stream because whales feed on squid swimming along the current's edge. The Gulf Stream carries warm water to the current that circles Greenland's southern coast, warming the air as it cools. Gradually, this cool, salty water drops to the ocean depths and moves southward in the deep ocean, completing the conveyor current in the Atlantic. About a hundred years ago, this Gulf Stream circulation and its interaction with icebergs in the North Atlantic played a critical role in the greatest ocean tragedy of the 20th century. Today, this river in the ocean is poised to play another critical role as scientists monitor changes in the world's climate. Our first story begins in April of 1912 in the cold North Atlantic. The Royal Mail Steamer Titanic was built in Belfast, Ireland by Harland and Wolfe shipbuilders. Nearly the length of three football fields, she is the largest moving object ever created. She has 20 lifeboats on board, more than required, but only enough to carry half of her passengers to safety. The Titanic is divided into 16 watertight compartments by watertight bulkheads containing electric doors. In June 1911, Shipbuilder magazine claimed that this design made the ship practically unsinkable. This unsinkable ship now lies on a gentle slope over three kilometers below the surface of the cold North Atlantic. The wreckage is in two parts. The bow, which is virtually intact, with its hull buried in silt on the ocean floor, and the stern, a mangled heap of wreckage far below the bow. With submersibles, we can explore this high-pressure hostile ocean environment that has become the grave of over 1,500 passengers and crew. The ship's violent impact with the ocean floor and decades submerged in the corrosive ocean have left few clues about the cause of the tragedy or the exact sequence of events that led to the fatal impact with the iceberg. To recreate conditions leading to this disaster, we will begin at dawn on April 14, 1912, the last sunrise for the RMS Titanic. Today begins Titanic's third full day at sea. The ship's luxury surpasses all expectations and the weather has been incredible. Calm and clear without any hint of a storm. On this beautiful Sunday morning, Captain Smith will hold a religious service in the first class dining room. Both the waning crescent moon and Venus rise just before the sun. These are the brightest natural objects in the night sky their light will be missed in the freezing darkness less than 24 hours from now. A 
radio message warning of icebergs ahead has just arrived, but Captain Smith assures us that the Titanic's construction makes it virtually unsinkable. Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line, seems even more confident. Each day, he urges the engineers to increase our speed through the calm seas. Passengers are all in high spirits. Any danger seems trivial when we stand on a deck over five stories above the water and look around at tons of steel protecting us. There is a real danger associated with clear, calm water. Without clouds to absorb heat, air and ocean temperatures drop below freezing at night and help preserve icebergs. Also, calm seas without waves slow melting and make it more difficult to spot a distant iceberg at night. Slight changes in the sun's energy output also cause changes in global climate. This graph shows the sun's variable brightness with an 11-year sunspot cycle on top of more gradual long-term variations. The sun produced less energy at the beginning of the 20th century than it has in any later year of the century. The Gulf Stream also had less effect than normal in warming the air, and April 1912 had more sea ice off the east coast of Newfoundland than any other April of the century. The Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company has installed its best radio transmitter and receiver on the Titanic. Its operators spend most of their time sending messages for passengers, but they also receive navigation warnings as needed. A second warning from the Dutch liner Nordum has just reported much ice ahead. The iceberg ahead of the Titanic probably calved in Greenland's Alulasat Ice Fjord in 1909, about the same time as work began on the Titanic in Belfast. Each year, the Yakushavan Glacier releases thousands of icebergs into the Alilisat Fjord. One or two of these will be megabergs, over a kilometer long and displacing a billion tons of seawater. In the open ocean, the deep keels of megabergs catch the cold Greenland current and ride it westward and northward to the Arctic, where they wait in floating Arctic ice fields for one or two years. Eventually, the cold Labrador current picks up these icebergs and carries them southward along the Canadian coast, past Newfoundland's Grand Banks. Many melt here, but a few drift further from shore and into shipping lanes. Icebergs finally melt in the warm Gulf Stream. In the cold, clear calm of April 7th through the 13th, 1912, as many as 20 ships reported seeing ice in North Atlantic shipping lanes. The radio room has received two more warnings of ice ahead. One also describes a ship that has run out of coal and is floating in shipping lanes. This story seems to upset Captain Smith more than the ice warnings. In fact, he has shared this story with Mr. Ismay. Captain Smith was probably far more worried about running out of coal than running into an iceberg. Because of a coal strike in Great Britain, the Titanic left port with its bunkers half full. As Bruce Ismay pushed the ship's speed, he also consumed critical coal reserves. Even more significant was a coal fire caused by spontaneous combustion, smoldering in the forward bunker of Boiler Room 5. By April 14th, all of the smoldering coal had been stoked into the boiler, but the hot coal had buckled and weakened a half-inch thick metal bulkhead between Boiler Room 6 and 5, a critical bulkhead in the impending tragedy. This distraction from the real iceberg danger would prove fatal in the hours to come. Our ship follows a great circle course from the fast net light off the tip of Ireland to a point in the empty ocean. Here the ship turns and steams straight for the Nantucket Shoal off the Massachusetts coast. We were supposed to make this course change at 5.20 p.m., but the captain delayed the turn for almost half an hour. This delay takes us a bit farther south than planned. Modern sea captains still use great circle courses, but they know far more about ocean conditions. Satellites provide images of the changing cloud cover over the turning globe during day and night. Other data sets show the paths and interactions of air currents over land and water. Satellites even monitor the speed of the ocean displaying great currents flowing through the ocean like rivers. These are shown in a lighter shade of blue, 
especially the Gulf Stream flowing around Florida and across the Atlantic toward Northern Europe. Thousands of automated buoys in all of the Earth's oceans beam information to satellites about surface conditions, such as temperature, ranging from the cold Arctic shown in violet and blue to the warm equatorial zone shown in orange and red. Meanwhile, ice-tethered profilers monitor conditions below the ice while riding on Arctic ice flows. Most importantly, the International Ice Patrol monitors glaciers for the calving of icebergs. Then it provides maps showing their location every day during iceberg season. A modern Captain Smith would have had satellite weather maps to predict the cold night to come and iceberg maps that showed a field of pack ice about five kilometers wide and over 50 kilometers long, extending across Titanic's path. But as darkness approached, Captain Smith had only a few iceberg warnings transmitted in terse Morse code and not routinely carried from the radio room to the bridge. Sunset is a beautiful time at sea, but tonight few passengers are willing to abandon their warm lounges for a cold stroll outside. By 7.10 p.m., Captain Smith left the bridge to join first-class dinner festivities. He asked to be called if anything unusual developed. At 7.30, the freighter Californian sent a message describing three large bergs eight kilometers to the south. These icebergs are only 80 kilometers ahead of the Titanic. At 9.40, a message from the SS Masaba reported heavy pack ice and many large icebergs lying just west of the Titanic. This message was never delivered to the bridge. Tonight there are only two lookouts, both in the crow's nest far above the bridge. Throughout the evening they observe the clear dark sky in the surrounding ocean. The ship creates a piercing 22 knot wind in their faces as they look forward. Due to an oversight, they have no binoculars to help their vision and to shield their eyes from the cold wind. Titanic lights up the sky like a modern city with its 10,000 glowing bulbs. Passengers who venture outside from Titanic's bright rooms have trouble seeing the brightest stars and cannot see unlighted objects like ice floating in the water or along the horizon. To the north, the Californian has stopped for the night in a large ice field. At about 11 p.m., the ship's wireless operator sends a message to the Titanic Say, old man, we're stopped and surrounded by ice. The Titanic operators reply, Shut up, shut up, I'm busy. This is one of the most costly errors in peacetime radio history. Because this critical message contained information about pack ice directly in front of the Titanic. After the rebuke from the Titanic, the radio operator of the California, the closest ship, turned off his radio for the night. The air temperature is now below freezing, and totally calm seas produce no waves to splash on icebergs and make them easier to see. Lookouts in the crow's nest report seeing a dark mass. After seven minutes, they ring the alarm bell three times and yell, Iceberg right ahead. Without moonlight or waves crashing into the ice, it is difficult to see an iceberg along the horizon. Also, older icebergs that have capsized often have trapped liquid water, which appears dark, especially on a clear, moonless night. Without binoculars, radar, or searchlights, the lookouts could not identify the dark mass until it was about three ship lengths away. First Officer Murdoch has ordered all stop, and nine decks down, engineers scramble, turning valves and pulling levers to stop the reciprocating engines and cut steam to the center turbine. Officer Murdoch then tries to turn the huge ship, hoping to avoid a collision. With the ship losing speed, it's much harder for the Titanic's small rudder to change the ship's direction, and the collision is inevitable. However, the actual impact happened below the water level, where seven-eighths of the iceberg was hit. Perhaps the Titanic went aground on an underwater ice shelf. The impact would have been relatively gentle slowing the ship gradually as deeper sections of the hull moved onto the ice. 
We know that many passengers slept through the impact. The Titanic stayed afloat two and a half hours, indicating that the area open to the ocean was less than a doorway in a hole. The impact pushed against steel plates and rivets weakened by water below freezing. Today, the steel in ships is more uniform and has fewer impurities. Welded hulls also have fewer seams to pull apart. The hull damage was so great that it opened forward holds two and three to the ocean and caused flooding in adjacent boiler room six and a smaller leak developed in boiler room five. Captain Smith and Bruce Ismay have returned to the bridge and the engines are coming back to life. The ship is moving forward again, but at reduced speed. Groggy passengers, reassured by the engine noises, turn over in their beds. Captain Smith and Mr. Ismay may have underestimated the amount of damage done to the hull and decided to move slowly to the nearest port, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Moving forward, first scooped water into the forward holds. Then as the bow tilted down, water rose above the tops of the bulkheads. Adjacent compartments were flooded from above, including boiler room six. Finally, the bulkhead damaged by fire between boiler room six and five gave way, flooding the neighboring boiler room five. Once this boiler room was compromised, the ship was doomed. An optical illusion called towering allowed lookouts on the freighter Californian to catch a glimpse of the brightly lit Titanic less than 20 miles away. At 1245, lookouts on the Californian saw the first of eight rockets, distress signals from the sinking ship. Without a radio operator on duty, these officers missed the distress call, which would have confirmed that they were seeing the sinking of the Titanic. To avoid panic and thus save lives, the captain has not given the abandoned ship order. Instead, the orchestra plays waltzes, ragtime, and music hall tunes to calm the crowd. As a result, the first lifeboats leave half full. Few people want to abandon their warm, unsinkable ship for the cold Atlantic. There have been no lifeboat drills, since there are no lifeboats for half the passengers. Wealthier passengers with cabins on higher decks reach lifeboats first. Many third-class passengers arrive after all the boats are gone. The last lifeboat leaves over 1,500 passengers behind on the sinking ship. For just over an hour, Titanic survivors huddled together in lifeboats and waited. At 3.30, they saw rockets from the rescue ship Carpathia. By 8.10, the last of the 705 Titanic survivors climbed on board, still in shock and mourning loved ones lost. 
On September 1, 1985, scientists and the crew of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's research vessel, NOR, used a new automated deep water robotic camera to discover the wreckage of the RMS Titanic. Image by image, they saw the luxury liner. Its boilers, bow, anchor chains, crow's nest, and railings. This is the burial site for passengers and crew trapped and entombed in the sunken ship. All dying because Captain Smith, who lies among them, did not prepare for the danger in his path. In response to the Titanic tragedy, the International Ice Patrol charts the locations of icebergs in the North Atlantic. Sonar and radar now tell modern captains of danger ahead. Radio rooms must always be in operation, and ships now sail with enough lifeboats to save everyone on board. We also know that icebergs and the currents that carry them play an important role in understanding Earth's climate. We now recognize that the Earth's ice caps are dynamic, and monitoring Arctic ice today may once again be the key to avoiding a tragedy tomorrow.